So I would like first to talk about principle of detection, spatial resolution, temporal resolution, sensitivity. Those are actually inherently related uh, terms. If you improve spatial resolution, you will have to pay a price, which is probably sensitivity or temporal resolution. Then quantification of the signal, corrections factors for quantifications. And of course, with regard to molecular imaging, the use of contrast agents is something which is very central, and I will speak a bit about MR contrast agents and how we can quantify the concentration in tissue. So that's what I started with. Uh, magnets, uh, essentially nuclei, we thought numbers of protons or neutrons possess a nuclear spin, which are associated with the magnetic moment. They are, of course, uh, microscopic features, which essentially means that the magnetic moments just have for a spin one-half nucleus two potential orientations in the magnetic field, either up or down or parallel or anti-parallel <coughs> to this uh, magnetic field, which is governed by two discrete different energy states. So if you have a, a nucleus in the absence of a magnetic field, if you put on the magnetic field, the nucleus aligns. It does not align perfectly, which essentially leads to yeah, that's a movie which should look different. The processing motion around the magnetic field, we tried this out, but obviously uh, it doesn't work on every computer. Now, the problem with MR which you have is uh, the energy separation between these two states is actually quite low. If we assume uh, a Boltzmann distribution between these two states, uh, then we come to a difference in populations, which is also related to the polarization, which is of the order of 10 ppm. So actually we see about 10 to the minus 5 of what we could potentially see. If you compare this with uh, optical imaging, with X-ray CT or with PET, where we are in this range here, where we see essentially everything which contributes to the signal in MR, we are very insensitive. And that's one of, of the basic limitations of MRI. We are inherently insensitive. And I'll come back to this later in my presentation. Now, uh, what I discussed here on the nuclear uh, level uh, also happens actually at the macroscopic magnetization level. So the macroscopic magnetization is the sum of all those nuclear magnets giving uh, a vector actually which is aligned along the magnetic field. If we generate a non-equilibrium state, uh, which, is, which means essentially we deflect this magnetization from the set axis where the field is located, we get this processing motion, which can be described by equations of motion. And essentially, it's the transverse component of this signal which generates, essentially, our NMR signal. So it's a transverse component only which we look at, and that's also something which we have to remember. If we now analyze the signal, how it behaves uh, as a function of time, we see the transverse components, the X and Y components, which actually give this circulatory motion, and we see the longitudinal magnetization, which is not fluctuating with this high frequency here. And essentially what would happen if, 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 if we were in a perfect world with no interaction whatsoever, this would be a procession, a procession motion forever. But of course, this is not the case in a real physical system. The signal decays, and it decays by uh, so-called relaxation processes. And we have to consider two relaxation processes, which are essentially in MRI, one is the transverse relaxation, so the decay of the transverse signal, and one is the longitudinal relaxation, the recovery, essentially, of the set component of our magnetization. And interestingly, the relaxation times for this process and for this process are not identical, which is one of the strengths of MR. You have different parameters which characterize the signal. Now, the most important formula which you have to remember, actually, is this one which you see here, that the resonance frequency is directly proportional to the magnetic field. That's essentially the basic principle how you encode spatial information. If you have a patient in a perfectly homogeneous field and we're just measuring the distribution of, of the spins and in 99.9% .9 the proton spins in the system, then essentially each proton in the body sees the same magnetic field and you would end up with a very sharp resonance line. Now, if we now make this field depending on the location by applying a magnetic field gradient, the resonance frequency here at the tip of the tail is different from the resonance frequency at the nose. And essentially what we end up with is a, with a uh, distribution, a projection actually, of the water distribution in this uh, mouse here, 
and we can, at least in one dimension, of course, now identify the resonance frequency to the position of the, of the protons in the body. And this is the basic principle how information is encoded. It's now trivial to, to ex- expand this. You just have to change the orientation of your gradient, get a new projection. If you have a sufficient number of projections, you can reconstruct the image. Now, a second problem which you have to solve is essentially we would like to get the tomographic information, and this needs, in addition to this grading encoding, also uh, spatially selective pulses, which has been solved. So you can apply an excitation to your body which just excites a small frequency domain which translates into a small slab through the body of the mouse in contrast to a uh, broad range excitation using uh, a non-selective pulse and by combining now gradient with the selective pulses you can select a slice within the body uh, and the pulses of course would have an ideal profile which is a slab which would mean that the pulse have an infinite duration in length uh, this is of course physically not, not, not possible so you truncate your pulses which leads then to artifacts in your slice definition which you have to know to properly reconstruct the images. Now, two-dimensional coding, as I said, can be done by just rotating the orientation of the gradient, and this was essentially the first application uh, of a description of MR imaging, which at that time was still called sigmatography by Paul Lotterbur in 73, where he just measured for a projection, and from this he reconstructed actually the distribution of the two capillaries. Actually, it was worth a Nobel Prize, as you know. He got the Nobel Prize in 2003. A bit later, actually, in 1975, Richard Ernst and this group developed Fourier sigmatography, which essentially is the same principle but a different encoding uh, mechanism. So you encode essentially sequentially in time, get also similar images. Uh, Richard Ernst got the Nobel Prize in 1991 for this, among others, this discovery. So it's really uh, a very well-decorated field. Uh, which has some problems because the sequential application induced relaxation artifacts, which was then corrected for by 1980 by spin warp, where you use the same principle, but instead of incrementing these times here, you increment the, the amplitudes of the gradients, and uh, this is called typically the spin warp method, which is today one of the standard methods. Now, uh, I don't walk, want to walk you through this equation, Essentially, the spatial information is obtained by applying this field gradient here to the static magnetic field. If you do a proper mathematical processing and introduce this variable here, k, which accounts essentially for the gradient strength and gradient duration, uh, you get a a relation which relates the image in the image space to the image in the time, in, in the image in the k space in the time domain to the image in the real image domain by a Fourier transformation. And I think this is really what one of the major breakthroughs, actually. And today, essentially, all images are, are collected in, in the time domain, in the K space, and then transformed into the Fourier space by a two- or three-dimensional Fourier transformation. Uh, the only thing which you have to do in order to reproduce the image truly is to fully cover the K space. So essentially, you have to cover all the frequencies which are required to describe the images. If you want to speed up the acquisition and say, well, we just scan the, the center of the K space, you still get the f- full image, but you get blurry, uh, blurry edges because the high frequencies here contain essentially the edge information in the images. And if you want to speed up the acquisition and say, well, I'm just record every second line or every third line, essentially, those are the images which you, which you record, and at the end, you have folding artifacts because the system is undersampled. You have not sampled all the frequencies which you need to sample, and based on that, essentially, you cannot discriminate whether the information here comes from a location at this point here or from a location here. So you get this overlay. But essentially, there are methods, actually, which, which makes use of this, uh, of this uh, special features and which are able essentially to deconvolve those type of images. And there are different methods to to, 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 to scan the K-space. There's gradient echo, spin echo, and and echo planar imaging. 
and you name it, there are many other uh, things which you can do. Now, an important aspect when you, when you talk of any imaging modality, of course, is spatial resolution. And, and uh, as, as the previous speaker has mentioned, uh, there is a nominal spatial resolution which is given by the pixel dimension, but there is an actual spatial resolution is, which means essentially how well can I discriminate features within an image. Uh, and you see here uh, a formula which determines, among other spatial resolution, sensitivity signal to noise. If you have a very high nominal resolution but a very poor signal to noise, you will not be able to discriminate small structures. So high signal to noise means essentially also the possibility to increase the spatial resolution. But does this mean, for instance, if you go from, from clinical imaging to mouse imaging and you would like to keep the same uh, relative uh, spatial resolution, you have your typical voxel dimensions of one millimeter cubed. You have your typical voxel uh, dimensions of 60 micrometer cubed, which essentially means that your voxel dimension is, or, is, is by orders of magnitude less in the mouse image as compared to uh, the human image. If we relate everything, uh, the size of the mouse uh, to the signal noise, we see that from here to here, we lose quite a considerable factor in signal noise, about a factor of 60 which essentially means, of course, if you look at the formula to compensate for a factor of 60, you have to measure much longer, which means roughly 4,000 times as long, which in most cases is not uh, uh, possible. So you can either decrease the spatial resolution or you can play with these games here, improve the sensitivity of your detected devices, reduce essentially the noise sources in your system, and that's what's being done. And as you can see, see this problem has been largely solved. We can get today also very high resolution images of small animals. But it's important to realize that spatial resolution, temporal resolution, and sensitivity are intimately linked. And if you improve one, you have to pay the price for the other two. Now, important in imaging is also contrast. And MRI, of course, characterized by a number of contrast parameters, which is attractive. Uh, relaxation times we have discussed T1, T2. T2 star actually is T2 in addition uh, with uh, the, the static susceptibility effects of the magnetic field, which is never perfect. There are other processes to be considered, diffusion, water diffusion, and exchange rates, etc., which all affect MR contrast, which actually is one of the strengths of the method because you have multiple parameters to optimize, which essentially means that you can tune your contrast to your specific applications, but you pay a price for that with regard to quantification because hardly is the image just determined by one of the parameters. For instance, if you look at relaxation, as I mentioned, uh, R1 and R2 relaxation, those are fundamentally different processes. This one tells how rapidly the longitudinal magnetization recovers, which essentially is an energy dissipation process. The spin system gets rid of the excess energy in interaction, actually, with the environment. So the spin system and the lattice, therefore, it's also called spin lattice relaxation. Transverse relaxation is telling you how rapidly, actually, the coherence is lost in your experiment, which is due to the fact that your system is never perfect. You have a distribution of energies uh, uh, between the two states, which essentially means that the resonance frequency is directly proportional to the magnetic field that we lose phase coherence because the, the different individual spins see a slightly different field and therefore get out of phase. So fundamentally different process, that's an energy interaction with the environment. That's just the loss of phase coherence. And that's, I think, a very important discrimination. We can, of course, measure those uh, relaxation parameters. For instance, R1 is measured by generating a non-equilibrium uh, situation because you're measuring here the return to equilibrium. So you have to start with a non-equilibrium uh, situation. Equilibrium would be the magnetization is along the magnetic field, which is here the plus one uh, orientation. If you invert it at the beginning, it starts to recover. But that's the longitudinal component which does not produce a signal. So you have to then translate the longitudinal information into transverse magnetization first. Therefore, you need the second pulse here, 90 degree pulse, and then you have the signal decay, and the amplitude of the signal decay tells you to what extent the relaxation has occurred in this process. In T2, it's slightly different. Uh, you have the defacing of the individual spin packet, 
uh, which gives rise to the signal. If you invert the whole thing with a 180 degree pulse, as shown in this case here, uh, this spin packet goes up to here, this one goes up to here, and then they process further on in the same direction, and after a while, actually, they all meet at this location here, which corresponds to the starting location. That's called the spin echo experiment. But you have lost part of the information here because you have this incoherent uh, loss of, of this loss of coherence, which happens to fluctuating processes here, and this decay here gives you information about the R2 relaxation. So we can measure the different processes and quantify this in terms of images. And typically we combine just as a contrast module, which essentially is encoding for the different uh, relaxation processes, for instance, with an image acquisition here to get actually a spatial distribution of relaxation times. <clears throat> now, when you characterize tissue, it's very attractive to go for MRI parameter images because if you just do a T1-weighted image, then it depends on your specific conditions, how you have a quiet image here or a T2-weighted image. You see here, those are all T2-weighted images, but the image appearance is very different if you go from the first images in the series to the last image in the series. And here it's less obvious, but it's essentially the same. But you can use this type of image series to compute actual distribution of T2 values, T2 values or T1 values, and this is not really a tissue characteristic which should be transferred from one system to the other one. It is dependent on the magnetic field which you're using, so, so a, a T2 map at 4.7 Tesla would look probably slightly different than a T2 map at 9.4 Tesla, so that's system dependent. But if you would like to get really quantitative information, you need those kinds of maps. And you see here an example in a stroke animal uh, uh, where we have measured different parameters, ADCT2, cerebral blood volume, cerebral bl uh, blood flow. Those are really parameter maps, and you see essentially how those parameters really have very different profiles as the, as the lesion develops. And you could essentially say for each point, you get a fingerprint characterized by, in this case, at least four different parameters, which gives you some information about the tissue state. And if you plot in for one region of interest the parameter as a function of time, you see they have very characteristic profiles. And that is being used actually to classify tissue. Now, MR is, is very strong in producing soft tissue contrast, but even this strong contrast may not be sufficient in many of the cases, and therefore you, you use contrast agent. And that's, of course, of particular interest if you move towards molecular imaging because Essentially, that's the specific contrast which you introduced in which you are interested. And you see here an image of a, of a glioma patient prior and after administration of a contrast agent. Here it's just a contrast agent which is actually passively flowing out of the vascular system, being trapped in the extracellular domain of the tissue. And you see the big difference between the pre-contrast data acquisition and the post-contrast data acquisition. Now, what are those type of contrast agents? Uh, when you look at your spin of interest, which is the white arrow here, that's your proton in which you're interested uh, in the magnetic field, it essentially feels, of course, the external magnetic field, and it actually also can sense the local environment given by different protons. So in order to really make a big impact on the spin, you have to modify the local environment. And you could do this, of course, by introducing, say, an, another proton, but this one would not be very efficient because, uh, I mean, you have here millions of protons around this one. If you introduce one or two more, this doesn't really change the situation. So what you would like to do is to introduce something which has a very strong local effect. And the only particle which has a much stronger magnetic moment that the proton does is the electron. So you have to introduce an electron close to your system of interest to massively change the local magnetic field. And how can you introduce an electron? Uh, there are different sources of those uh, unpaired electrons. Ones are stable free radicals, as shown here, uh, which normally contain a nitrosa group, which is uh, sterically uh, protected here. Uh, this is not very efficient because you just have one, typically one unpaired electron per molecule. You can use transition metal complexes, so the transition metal is the blue sphere, uh, the gray sphere here is the chelating ligand, which you need actually to, to avoid toxicity. 
Uh, and here you have, of course, transition metal complexes or lanthanide complexes, which have, in this case, up to seven, and in this case, up to five unpaired electron. So you have a much stronger relaxation effect. Or you can use nanoparticles, typically iron oxide nanoparticles, which contains hundreds of iron uh, atoms, which are actually containing unpaired electrons. You get a very strong interaction here. You have to coat it with an organic ma matrix to make it biocompatible. Uh, in this case here, the relaxation arises from the coupling of a water molecule to this complex here. It's mainly a T1 effect. It's called also positive enhancing. And in this case here, uh, the water has no access to the ion. It's, it's protected by this coating. It's mainly a T2 effect which dominates uh, the signal. If you make it target specific, you have to link uh, your reporter group, paramagnetic, superparamagnetics, etc., to a targeting moiety here, which is an antibody receptor ligand, which then essentially finds its molecular target, hopefully, in the body. I mean, here the key issue probably is not the probe's uh, present, uh, preparation, but rather optimizing the biopharmacokinetic uh, probabilities that it can reach its, its target. But I will not discuss this. This is part of different education courses. Now, how can you estimate what you are then interested in, actually? What is the local concentration of my contrast agents at the target site? And uh, the overall relativity consists of two contributions. One is the intrinsic relativity, which just generates contrast in the MRI. And then you have the contribution of the paramagnetic center. So these two terms essentially are the terms which are determining the overall relativity. And that's the one in which we are interested, because this one is related to the concentration of the paramagnetic center at my target site. And uh, this part here is proportional to the local concentration of my, of my uh, molecule and the distribution volume of my molecule. And that's the proper proportionality factor, which is called the molar relaxivity. So if you would now like to, to translate information from a mini image, which is the enhancement of the signal into concentrations, it depends which sequence you are using. If you use a T1-weighted sequence, then this is the formula which you can use in first approximation. It's actually valid for small changes, actually, in relativity, which is not always the case. Then it's just a, essentially a subtraction. You, you have the enhancement factor, and you have to comp correct for the concentration term here, and then essentially you get the concentration of your agent at this uh, location in the tissue. If you go for a T2-weighted image, it's slightly different because uh, you have now an exponential de dependence of your signal on the concentration here. The overall concentration on, on relativity is the same, but the, co uh, the contrast agent concentration is calculated slightly different, and you translate your signal uh, change, which is now, in this case, a decay, because if T2 inc uh, relaxation increases, T2 times decreases, this means that the signal gets weaker, but a weak signal means a high concentration of the contrast agent. So if you use this formula, you can translate essentially the signal intensity change into a change in the concentration of your contrast agent. Now, there are some caveats in this, in, in, in this uh, derivation here. Normally, we assume that the dependent is linear, as, uh, uh, and, and this is used to calculate the concentration. Uh, we did once an experiment uh, to estimate kidney clearance uh, using contrast agents, increased the concentration, and essentially found that the dependent is not linear, the deviations from this linear behavior, which means that the deriving of quantitative information becomes very complicated. You have to make sure that you deal in this region here in order to get really accurate quantitative data. If you deviate from that, then, of course, you have to consider all the nonlinear effects which are not that easy to include. Secondly, we have mixed contrast. If you have a contrast agent which affects T1, it also affects T2 and vice versa. And you see here, that's a typical contrast agent, gadolinium DTPA. If we use different parameters for data acquisition, uh, repetition times here, which is the T1 weighting, and echo time, which is the T2 weighting, the signal profiles look, look very differently. So essentially, you have to know what are your proper conditions? And you also have, to, if you translate, of course, signal enhancements into concentration, you may, you may face ambiguities. You have actually two 
enhancement values which are compatible with central with two concentration values. And only if, if you know the whole trend, actually, you are able to assign the proper concentration. So that's indicated here. Uh, this would be, if you would not include T2 effects, this is including T2 effects in a T1 relaxation experiment. And uh, this has practical consequences here. So you see here kidney clearance, and you see here the pelvis where the concentration accumulates at a very high concentration. It is first bright and then gets dark. If you just measure the concentration profile, you can, can get up this solution, but it also might be this solution here, but because here it's just a T2 effect which starts to dominate. And you have to be aware of that to make the proper concentration estimates. We measure concentration in a voxel, which is the minimal element which we can resolve, which contains different cell types, which has interstitial space, which contains uh, blood vessels. So what we are measuring essentially is the concentration as the weighted sum of all the diff different contributions from the different compartments. And this will be discussed actually in more detail, I presume, next year or the following year. I just will briefly touch on that. In order to understand really uh, what the concentrations are at your target site, you have to solve this problem and decompose these individual contributions into two different compartments. I will not discuss the compartment modeling here, but this is an integral part really which you have to consider if you would like to derive quantitative information. And this brings me to my last slide, which tells you that proton images represent the weighted distribution of water and adipose tissue, that we are inherently insensitive, which I think is a major limitation of MRI, that the spatial resolution is linked to sensitivity and temporal resolution. We cannot really look at one without looking at the others, which is important. Data are typically acquired in K-space, which is linked to the image space by a Fourier transformation, which is a very elegant solution, actually, of, of, the, of the reconstruction problem. Fourier transformation is something which can be very efficiently carried out. There are different weighting factors or contrast parameters, relaxation times, microscopic motion, diffusion, perfusion, and spin exchange, chemical exchange, polarization transfer, spin diffusion, which all affect MR contrast, which I think are the major source of contrast in, for soft tissue. MRI contrast parameters are tissue specific. I think that's really the beauty of the method. But really, to get a good characterization of the tissue, you need to generate parameter images. You have to have a T1 image of an image or a t of, 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 a, of a tissue, a T2 image, etc. They still depend on B0, on the magnetic field. So if you compare images at different field strengths, they may look differently. Contrast may be enhanced through administration of contrast agents that uh, contain unpaired electrons. Transition metals and, and lanthanides are the most commonly used, but also iron oxide nanoparticles. And molecular information can be obtained by, by linking, actually, this contrast report group, actually, to uh, targeting moiety, antibodies, small molecules, whatever. And I think that's the last slide of my presentation, if I'm correct, and I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>